Hey everybody, welcome back to Chicago Reacts. My name is Michael, I'm an actor here in the city of Chicago, and I am joined by the ever brilliant, the always talented, the one, the only, it's Zach, also an actor here in the city of Chicago. Ladies and gentlemen, we have switched seats, and we are back with the Anchor Oversimplified Part 2. Um, we, have, we actually grabbed a quick meal in between <laughs> watching these two parts, so uh, Part 2 should be, should be a real, real joy. Forgive me if I hiccup at all. I had some spicy habanero salsa in this one. Jeez. Um, let's jump into it, though. Part one was great. Yeah, check out the, uh, the description down below to check out all of our personal links as well as the links to the Anchor Discord. Here we go. Since Germany's military had to be reduced, Hitler could no longer remain a soldier after the war, but he kept working for the army as an informant. After the war, communists in Germany had attempted a revolution, and the government was worried about communism in general. So Hitler was tasked with infiltrating and reporting on any new political parties that could pose a communist threat. <laughs> a new party called the German Workers' Party threw up a whole bunch of red flags. So Hitler went along to one of their meetings, but found that they weren't communist at all. They were extreme right and shared many of his extreme beliefs. So he left the army and signed up to join the party. His fantastic speaking abilities impressed the party's leadership and supporters, and he very quickly rose to the top. He decided the party needed a makeover, so he renamed it to the National Socialist German Workers' Party, or Nazi for short, and he gave it a new color scheme. The Nazis weren't very specific on policy, but Hitler made extravagant promises to return Germany to its former glory by undoing the Treaty of Versailles and reuniting all ethnic Germans into one nation. He also said that only pure Aryan people should be allowed to be citizens and that all Jews would lose their citizenship. These ideas were already common in extreme right politics, but what set the Nazis apart was Hitler himself, and they quickly became the leading party on the extreme right. Many of the political parties in Germany at the time had paramilitary wings, and the Nazis were no- So that's something that's kind of interesting too, it's like, when you're thinking about World War II, like, you don't really think about it in terms of politics, really. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Like, when, when, you, when, you, when you break down, like, Base essentially Hitler versus the rest of the world. Yeah, you're not really thinking of it in terms of a a a, a political sort of fight. Like, I didn't I didn't even really realize or think about the fact like there were other political parties in Germany. Right. At the time. Well, and my understanding was they never actually won even a majority. Right. They were, but they they won like the majority of votes to form a government. But there were other factions that were smaller. Right. Um. Which is a good reason for rank choice voting, in my opinion. Right. But yeah, they they were able to control out of from a pos minority position. Um, yeah, yeah, which yeah. It, which it, which it just must really speak to his public speaking ability. I mean, it real truly must have been next level. Yeah, for him to have essentially created himself out of nothing and be the leader of his party, and then to end up taking essentially majority majority control over Germany and its forces at the time. Yeah, someone's um, ability to speak eloquently enough or, or, or just passionately en enough can be a really dangerous thing. Um, yeah. <laughs> We've seen it here live, folks. It's... <laughs> No different. Hitler set up the very descriptive whole protection detachment, later changed to the very delightful gymnastic and sports division, and finally settling on the ominous storm detachment, or SA for short. Their job was to defend Nazi party meetings and intimidate political opponents, and they would frequently engage in battles with communists on the streets. Since the Allies had demanded a reduction in Germany's military size, many trained soldiers were left unemployed. They liked the Nazi ideology, and it was only natural for them to join the SA, which grew larger and larger over time. The new democratic government that formed after World War I was pretty weak and ineffective. In order to pay reparations to the Allies, it started printing more money. The problem is that printing money doesn't actually give a country more money, it just makes money less valuable. So as the country printed more and more money, it became worth less and less, and the currency crashed. In 1919, one US dollar was worth about four German marks. By December 1923, one US dollar was equal to 4.2 trillion marks. The oh. price of bread rose to two... <laughs> oh my god oh I, I knew no. inflation was a thing following oh, world I war one that's so bad oh that's rough oh my 
I mean, yeah. That, that, I mean, oh my takes, god! How do you you can't pay for anything then? Like everything becomes so, oh, so oh, expensive. Geek. Sorry, I'm messing with my levels over here. I want to make sure that we're yeah. <laughs> that we're good. We're still we're still working on the on the new setup and the balancing. So we'll do some updates. But... Yeah, leave us those uh, <laughs> feisty comments. Those, that feedback in the comment section. How many billions of marks would you pay to I mean, get us to just shut up? I think what's what's unfortunate though too is like, who does this affect most? It affects like people who are not able to work, who are living off of savings or something like that. Like people are who are making money are continuing to make that much more money. Right. But it really affects the middle and working class people who are living paycheck to paycheck. Um. And, or and, who are or have a small savings, you yeah, know. Or, but as soon or as the, the, the older people, or yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, um. So I I just think that's unfortunate. Like, inflation really affects the least. Um. I mean, it affects a majority of the population, but right. the ultra wealthy still like are making lots of money, and it's just, uh, it's just a slippery slope. Yeah, and it's like, how do you get out? Once this happens, how do you get out of this? Yeah. Like, like once you're, you're essentially, you have broken your entire economy. It's just broken. It's like, yeah. How is that even going to be repaired? Yeah. Um, dude, that's crazy. Clearly a pause for this moment. Yeah. Because yeah, yeah. that multi-grain <laughs> bread is looking pretty damn good. For two it does look marks. good. It does <laughs> look good for two billion marks. marks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 200 billion marks. Banknotes became worthless. Unsurprisingly, in such an economic crisis, Germany struggled to pay the Allies. The French were pissed about this, so they occupied the Ruhr, an area full of factories, and took the economic output from the area as payment. They treated the German civilians badly, and in total, approximately 130 Germans were killed during the occupation. Germans were furious, and Hitler and the Nazis thought that now would be a great time to lead a revolution. In November 1923, inspired by something a certain bold Italian man did a year earlier, Hitler stormed a meeting at a beer hall and called for an uprising against the government. With his supporters, he marched on the streets of Munich, hoping the police would join his side. They did not. Hitler was put on trial for treason. He could have been sentenced to life, but the right-wing judges thought he was a pretty cool guy. Hitler knew the judges and knew that they would be lenient, so he took the opportunity to make impassioned speeches during the trial. And in the end, he was sentenced to just five years in prison, of which he only served nine months. And when I say prison, it was more like a pleasant hotel stay where he had plenty of time to write a book. The whole affair was covered by the media nationwide, and it made Hitler famous. Hitler and his extreme message were now known throughout Germany. But the everyday Germans still didn't care much for him. In the 1928 election, the Nazis only won about 2% of the vote. Many were still intimidated by all the violence and the shouting and how unpolitician like he was. But a new economic crisis would change all of that. To help Germany pay its reparations, America agreed to give it loans. In October 1929, the Wall Street crash happened, and America wanted its money back. The economic strain this put on an already struggling Germany was severe. Unemployment skyrocketed, poverty was widespread, and Germans were sick of it. It was clear that the newly formed democracy wasn't working. In the face of crisis, Germans began moving to the political extremes. If you were German and wanted change, your choices now were either the communists or the Nazis. Hitler claimed that he was the only one who could return Germany to its former glory. The Nazi party used propaganda to make Hitler seem like a great and powerful man, and they gave the German people a scapegoat to blame for all their suffering. The promise of a single strong dictator was a breath of fresh air for Germans after years of failing democracy. It's almost like a religion. I mean, it, it's it's like well, it's hopeless people looking for something to hope in, right? You right. know, I mean, we all. I think. I mean, when you are destitute and you don't have anything, and someone is promising you uh, stability and comfort, and hey, this is going to be you know the glory of the old days, the glory of a time before. Um, Not only that, but like you, you literally have nothing. Yeah. I mean, when you're already at that place, yeah. But just the whole idea of like putting blame on an entire race of people, it just came across as almost like biblical in the sense of like anybody that doesn't obey the word of God is a sinner. Like, it, it's like creating an us versus them, almost like that kind of, yeah. that, that yeah. just, it, it gives it almost like a, like, and then like Hitler acting like a theological God figure. There are definitely some parallels with religion, and I, 
organized. Yeah, like organized for religion. Yeah. Like, I mean, it's it's really just yeah another organization based around ideals, and you have your active members, and unfortunately, yeah, you're create you're creating an other to explain away all the reasons why things aren't good. Some bought into his extreme ideology. Some didn't agree with the racism, but were willing to vote for him anyway. Many didn't know much about politics at all, but just got caught up in the hype. Election after election, the Nazis became more and more popular, until in 1932, they became the biggest party in the German parliament. Hitler came to truly believe that he was some sort of great, destined savior of Germany. He turned megalomaniac. He decided to run for president, and did surprisingly well, but still lost to the extremely popular World War I general, Paul von Hindenburg. Since he was now the leader of the biggest party though, he demanded President Hindenburg make him chancellor. But Hindenburg was reluctant, seeing that Hitler was clearly such a big racist. Industry leaders urged Hindenburg to give Hitler the chancellorship, fearing the rising support for communism. And leader of the center party von Papen, who had been secretly negotiating with Hitler, said to Hindenburg, how about we make Hitler chancellor on the condition that I get to be vice chancellor and most government jobs go to us moderate conservatives. That way, I'll get to keep my power, I mean we'll get to keep our power and we'll control Hitler like he's our angry little puppet. What could possibly go wrong? As it turned out, everything. Yeah. Hitler became Chancellor of Germany in January 1933, but he was not yet a dictator. In February, what? the German parliament- Do you know what the position of Chancellor is over President or what does that mean? Um, is that like- either specifically like in charge of military or police or exec like is it i'm, right. I'm, I'm not, curious if you know let us know in the comment section down below yeah i'm not sure if um like i mean could it even be like subjective like from 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 country to country or from system to system because you have the chancellor and the members and then like the senate i don't know well, for a chancellor earns X power. I mean, I would assume that it does in this, like in the German government at this in point. Gym, right. And I'm just right. curious what that is. I guess I'm sure. not familiar with it. I mean, I'm, but I'm assuming it's probably some kind of military right. control, I would think. But, or I mean, like state control over certain. Yeah, I'm not sure. Yeah. I feel like you guys in the comments, all, like, you guys always blow us away with how knowledgeable guys are especially some of you history buffs out there so any info that you could provide about the history of Boston you guys are always because this has truly been a very comprehensive yeah yeah definitely. building was set on fire historians still aren't sure who did it and many suspect the Nazis did it themselves but Hitler blamed the communists and he convinced President Hindenburg to sign an emergency decree allowing him to imprison all communists and other political opponents Communists and others were sent off to the first concentration camp in Dachau. At this time, the elderly President Hindenburg passed away, giving Hitler the perfect opportunity. He introduced a law to Parliament that would allow him to make all future laws and decisions entirely on his own. With his political opponents in prison and the SA intimidating others, Hitler's law passed. Just two months after becoming Chancellor, Hitler was now a dictator. He still had one problem. The leader of the SA wanted the SA to take over the job of the regular German army and the German army didn't like that idea. Hitler needed to maintain the support of his professionally trained German army, more so than his rough and rowdy SA. So one night in June 1934, he had Rom and many other of his own SA officers rounded up and murdered. While he was at it, he took the opportunity to brutally settle some personal scores as well. Politicians who had disagreed with him in the past, reporters who had printed negative articles about him, one guy who did absolutely nothing, but they thought he was someone else. In some cases, even their families were murdered. In total, up to 200 people were killed in what became known as the Night of the Long Knives. The army, now satisfied that they wouldn't be replaced, pledged total allegiance to their new Führer I and Hitler's like... control. Man. I don't know if I've ever really gotten into the nitty gritty of how Hitler came into power. And it is crazy to see that there were systems in place that were designed to keep something from like this happening that crumbled, that he was able to work through. And well, I think that yeah. is, I don't know, that it just makes it a little more frightening. It, I, it feels like something like, oh, it was 
it was always like able to happen. It suddenly happened. And then the world realized this isn't okay. We need stronger like protections against something like this happening. But there were systems like that sh were, should have been in place to keep uh, one man from gaining complete control over the government. And they all failed. And I don't know, it makes, it makes uh, our current, uh, I don't know, it just makes the current situation a little bit more. Yeah, I think we, we're seeing the rise of Individuals who want to take control over governments throughout the throughout the world, and I think it's uh, scary to see how possible it truly is if enough systems fail. Yeah, and just thinking about um, how many things have been turned on in the past. Yeah, and Hitler, real. I mean, this clearly wasn't something that happened overnight either. Right. I mean. The stuff that happened overnight was once Hitler got to where he wanted to be. Yeah. But um, he he sure did everything he could to play his cards right to be able to win the opportunity that came to slowly make progress. And, and we should be, we should be we should be very we should have a very heightened sense of awareness when yeah. certain. In society, whether it's ours or somebody else in the world, it's, yeah. it's we should have a much more heightened sense of we've seen this before, and even though it doesn't seem to be happening now, the domino effect continues to increase. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. This is the, I watch, and I'm like, I'm just literally like scared. Seeing, yeah, seeing I think. This yeah, it definitely feels more. And and I'll, I would also say, growing up in the United States, I think we learn um, World War II history from a very specific viewpoint of, yeah, we came in and we helped and we saved every saved the day and we fixed everything, and. I do think it tends to blur over some of these nitty, nitty, nitty gritty, like not even nitty gritty, just specific details of like Hitler coming to power. It's, it's very easy to be ignorant when you have the ability to be ignorant. Yeah. When you don't have the ability to worry, clearly ignorance played a part in every step of this evolution of, of the Nazi party. Yeah. was now absolute. Life in Germany changed violently. Freedom of the press, expression, and public assembly were suspended. Jews were initially branded and their businesses boycotted. And eventually, Hitler would go on to have six million Jewish men, women, and children killed in concentration camps. Hundreds of thousands of people were forced into sterilization for physical and mental imperfections. The Hitler youth became a way to brainwash the young. Boys were trained to fight and returned home from camp violent. Girls were told their purpose was to have many pure Aryan children, and they would sometimes return from camp pregnant. When their parents were understandably horrified, their children would threaten to turn them over to the Gestapo for standing in the way of Germany's greatness. The standard greeting changed, and you could be sent to a concentration camp for not using it. This way, it seemed like everyone was a Nazi supporter. If you dared oppose Hitler, or speak out against him in any way, you also would be sent to a concentration camp. German nationalism captivated the young Adolf. Extreme ideology and anti-Semitism festered in him as a young man living a hard life on the streets. Germany's defeat in the First World War filled him with hatred and a thirst for vengeance. A political movement that treated him like a god and hundreds of thousands looking up to him as their savior made him a megalomaniac. And soon, his aggressive foreign policies would drag the world into a second tragic global conflict, otherwise known as Yeah. It's it's also just like amazing that you know from from being literally at the lowest of the low, following that World War One defeat, 
yeah. how they were able to essentially become so powerful so quick. And like the, the psychology of those 25 years there are just absolutely extraordinary. They're like, they're, they're like almost like those ancient civilization days yeah of, but we have resources so we're gonna right, rise like, up like and, the kings of Earth, like big almost like empires that were created and this feels like that and you can it's like by studying this you can understand how these how these massive empires in the past how how psychic is everything. Yeah. If you if when you have control over over a psyche of an entire nation's worth of people, it shows right there. It's like you, the, the world's your oyster. You know? Yeah. Um, you get people to do horrible things because they're accepting the needing something, and you create a scapegoat, and you. And it's scary how how easy it is for us to slip into that. Like I think it feels scary, especially in recent years. But um, man, oversimplified is getting us <laughs> talking about heavy stuff, but yeah. we are enjoying it. Thank you so much, oversimplified. We really appreciate. Um, this this was a uh, a long reaction to your thing for I think I think it just goes to show like. Again, how important, how important, so so important. Critical. Yeah, this this information is the application, as scary and terrifying as it is, or whether or not, regardless of kind of whether you're, what your personal beliefs are about wanting to share things like this. Yeah, it, it you know, it sucks, but it's kind of almost like a necessity. And like I was saying in part one, yeah, I think so many people would benefit so so much, especially young people. Because I think very from a very early on it was like how this happened. Yeah. Caught me off guard. Yeah. Well, and I don't know if we have to be that I mean, I personally don't think I guess I don't as an individual want to be afraid to say I am not anti Semitic and I don't believe in anti Semitism or scapegoating other marginalized people here or abroad. So we're just making that statement because yeah. <laughs> it feels important in our uh, trying times. So um, we need to do what we can to band together as, as human beings who, um, yeah, I mean, these last few years on this planet have been challenging, specifically for marginalized groups and um, people without as many resources as others. So and hey, uh, when, when take care of your neighbors and do what you can. When, to, when, well, yeah. when gas is $6 a gallon, Anything goes. Yeah. Uh, just to, like, <laughs> let that be a sign. Somebody's starting like, a revolution. <laughs> um, much love to all of y'all, and we will see you guys next time on Chicago Reading.